here because the outside world rejects you. Hey, what's up everyone? So Ninja Turtles The Last Ronin, issue number four, Blood and Snow, is now out in comic book shops. And today we're going to go ahead and talk about it. Make sure to get your copy today. It is also available on Kindle if you want to follow along here. But don't worry too much if you don't have it yet. First, I'll give you my general thoughts without any spoilers in the first section of the video. But after, we will go ahead and discuss everything, spoilers and all. I'll give you a warning when we get there. But there's not too much more to say. Let's just go ahead and dive right in. So I'll keep this non-spoiler portion of the video short. I know a lot of you have already read the book, but for those who haven't, here are my general thoughts. This and the first issue are probably my two favorite out of the run so far. Hard to tell which one I like more. The first one is such a classic now, but this one has such a good sequence about midway through the book that is probably my favorite moment in the entire series. The art has the same technique that they've used before with the present work being done by the Scorza brothers and Ben Bishop doing the main flashbacks with Kevin Eastman doing the flashbacks of the Ronin on his own. Own. It's kind of cool how they did it in this issue though. There's like a flashback within a flashback and it's cool how we get pulled in and out of that with the different art styles. This issue is probably the most action packed pretty much from start to finish has big sequences going on in the past and in the present. Honestly I don't know what else I could say without spoiling stuff so we'll go ahead and jump into spoilers now but if you haven't read it yet and were thinking about it I definitely recommend this one. I think it's a must have for Turtles fans and even just comic book fans in general. So we'll go ahead and jump into spoilers now and we'll start with the stuff that goes on in the flashbacks first. I feel like people are really looking forward to hearing about that stuff and breaking down what happened. But there's also some pretty big revelations in the present as well and we'll jump into that after. But first let's break down what happened to Mikey, Donnie, and Splinter in the past. So as we saw in one of the teaser images for Blood and Snow, in the present, April asks Mikey what happened to Splinter and Donatello. And this is where we jump back. And at first it starts us off in a flashback in Kevin Eastman's art style. And it's of Mikey getting off of a plane. And based off an old map Splinter had lying around, he goes in search of Clan Hamato. Through the countryside and over some snow covered mountains, he eventually reaches what looks like a remote village and is quickly surrounded by samurai guards. The real deal as he describes it. Michelangelo was then taken to one of the elders there, Master Shinichiro of Clan Hamato. Mikey explained who he was and asked for Splinter and Donatello, but the elder appeared saddened and not wanting to look at Michelangelo in the eye. This part was very sad. You knew what was coming next. And Mikey's face in this part also gives the same feeling like he knew he was about to receive some horrible news. And it's at this point that the comic jumps into an even further flashback in Ben Bishop's art style. And this was the part I was talking about earlier in the non-spoiler section, probably my favorite sequence of the entire series. It starts off with Donatello and Splinter arriving in the same village in the middle of the night. They are greeted by Master Shinichiro. They discuss the upcoming peace talks with the Foot Clan and Splinter says he's cautiously optimistic. Little does he know Leonardo and Casey have been killed back home. If you remember Donatello and Splinter had to turn off their radio communications to not be detected as they flew over to Japan. Donatello even asked Splinter in this part if he can go radio Leonardo. Splinter says go ahead but one can assume Donatello doesn't get a response from the other end. Well, looks like the following morning, Splinter and Donatello and some of Clan Hamato's guards arrive at the meeting place, a local cemetery. The vibe isn't right. Something is off. It seems like a weird place to meet for peace talks. Some representatives of the Foot Clan are there, including Ambassador Hara, but Oroko Hiroto is not there. This display of bad faith upsets Splinter. You can see that Hara starts to get nervous as Splinter starts to see what's going on. Suddenly, Hiroto arrives on horseback wearing what looks like some old school shredder armor. I thought this part looks super cool. And there's even a cover that they revealed that has this on the front. Probably safe to say that's going to sell out fast. First, he insults Splinter and asks if he's heard from his family in New York, insinuating he killed them, which he did with Baxter Stockman's help. This pisses off Splinter and he immediately decapitates the foot representatives in one fell swoop. This part was so badass. Anyways, a battle begins and you can hear Splinter tell Donatello, no mercy, my son. The two start taking out foot soldiers. Splinter flies through 
through the air, slicing soldiers as he goes. Donatello can be seen impaling a foot soldier in the face with his bow staff. The two are visibly enraged about the loss of their family. Hiroto, upset that his forces are being defeated, as they do have the numbers, just not the discipline, calls in his archers. During this part, Hiroto tricks Splinter by taunting him, saying everyone you have known and loved is gone, all dead. Splinter, blinded by anger, stays on the battlefield, yelling at Hiroto to face him like a true warrior. Donatello can be seen in the background begging his father to retreat and regroup. As the archers are approaching, Splinter charges towards Hiroto, but Hiroto orders the archers to fire, and just before the arrows begin to strike, Splinter launches his sword towards Hiroto, stabbing him in the shoulder. Splinter yells, for my family as he does this, but it's not enough, as he and Donatello, who runs over to try to shield his father, begin to get struck by the assault. You can hear Donatello in his final moments trying to protect his father, yelling, father get behind me, as the arrows begin to hit him. Splinter cries out, my son, as he also starts to get hit, and the two are killed, as you can see in the next page, that the Hamato clan are visibly upset, looking at their arrow-covered bodies that lie dead on the ground. Hiroto retreats as the Hamato clan archers then arrive, a little too late though. After this, it jumps back to the Eastman-style flashback of Michelangelo listening to the story. He has shown the ashes of his brother and his father as they have been cremated and is given their personal belongings. He is offered a spot in the Hamato clan, but he respectfully rejects the offer and goes off into the mountains, where as we saw in the issue two flashbacks, he becomes the last Ronin. Now as for the present, there was some interesting reveals that go on here, one in particular, which we'll get to in a second. So it starts off as we see that Casey Marie is training, and Michelangelo is secretly watching, while talking to the ghosts of his dead brothers. They all are impressed at what they are seeing, and believe that with some real training, she might have something. Mikey tests to see if she's willing to learn, as Mikey teases her, and tells her to show him what she's got, to come at him as hard as she can. At first, there's some hesitation, but Mikey insults her some more, and so she does. This is where we kinda got a glimpse of the old Michelangelo, as he toys with her, making funny remarks as they go along. Reminded me of the 2003 Michelangelo a little bit, when he would tease Raphael. Anyways, he tells her she's practically family, and that he wouldn't mind teaching her as long as she could follow directions. Never really having a mentor, she loves the idea and hugs Michelangelo as she calls him sensei. We see that April overheard the whole thing, and this is where we get a pretty big revelation. After Casey leaves and Mikey is talking to April, Mikey asks April, when were you going to tell me about Casey Marie's extra abilities? So that's big news. She's not a normal human. And now some of the stuff that the staff have talked about makes a little bit more sense too. If you remember a while back there was an article of them discussing the idea for potential prequels and sequels to this story. The prequel part made sense. That'd be cool to see what adventures these turtles went on. Their universe is pretty dark. So just the thought of that and all the different villains that they could face in this environment is a pretty cool idea. And now the sequels make sense with this Casey Marie reveal. The way I'm thinking about it is if it does happen it's almost going to be an adventures of the last Ronin and Casey Marie. It'd be cool if they called her Shadow. At least that's what it's starting to look like. Let's see if they move forward with that. Now April says she thinks trace amounts of Nietzsche's DNA were passed on from her birth parents. So April and Casey Jones, who had a lifelong exposure to it from the company they kept, Splinter and the Turtles. So it seems, at least from what April's saying, that the turtles, at least throughout their whole life, were radiating something, at least on very low levels, which caused this. April says about Casey Marie that she's basically normal in all aspects, except other than strength, speed, and her healing abilities, all of which have increased with age. She also says that Casey Marie is aware that she's different, but that they haven't told her why yet, but that they will soon, and to keep it a secret for now. Next, we get a scene of everybody in a war room getting ready for the attack on Baxter Stockman's island. It kind of reminded me of those scenes from the old Star Wars movies of them planning to launch an attack on the Death Star. They are going over the plans of taking down Baxter Stockman's facility. This part's kind of funny because they're cutting between the plans being discussed and them actually fulfilling them out on the battlefield. And on the battlefield, things aren't going as planned. And Michelangelo can even be heard saying this was a bad plan as he cleans up everyone's messes. Baxter can be seen inside receiving an alert about the attack. Stockman looks like he's been through stuff over the years. He is now part man and part machine. First, he thinks it's just a bunch of punks trying to steal some equipment and doesn't take it very seriously and just sends out some of his guards. You even see Hiroto get alerted of the situation. He says to send out a squad over to Stockman's facility. Once Baxter eventually sees that it's a little bit more serious than just some people trying to steal some equipment, he sends out a swarm of mousers, which are taken down by an EMP. When April arrives in a big turtle tank, they make their way into the facility and April takes Fugitoid's head with her and connects it into Baxter Stockman's systems. This next part was pretty emotional. Baxter sees Fugitoid is there and confronts
confronts April, who punches him. As she says, this was for my husband, Baxter smacks her to the ground and goes to grab Fugitoid, who is now powered on. Fugitoid says, you shall not pass. Lord of the Rings reference, pretty nice. Anyways, he says it again and starts electrocuting Baxter. And then his next line was a bit heart-wrenching. He says, you shall pay for my family, for my friends, for everything. Talking about Splinter and the Turtles. Next, we see a big explosion as Baxter disintegrates alongside Fugitoid's head. April says, goodbye, honeycut. Thank you. And we see this nanobite swarm from the explosion start entering Baxter's systems, powering them all down. April says, honeycut, Fugitoid is now in control. And we see Hiroto's defenses are shutting down all over the city. We even see robot foot soldiers start falling down in the streets and civilians start smashing them, yelling, Hiroto's next. Hiroto can then be seen commanding a full tactical alert, getting everyone with a weapon to his tower to protect them. The Ronin, April, and Casey Marie can then be seen standing on some rubble, looking at the city. Casey says, I think we won. April says, yeah, the battle, not the war. And Mikey says, and not at a price I'm willing to pay anymore, as we see soldiers from their side picking each other up and limping away. And that's where the chapter ends. So yeah, that's what went down in issue number four. I hope you enjoyed what I had to say on the most recent installment of Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin. Let me know what y'all think down below as well. I personally love this issue. Love the Donatello and Splinter flashback, especially. I think it's the best death scene in the entire run. Raph's was great, but he was alone. Leo and Casey's was also good, but it happened so fast with it being an explosion that got them. This one was truly a gut punch. Watching Donatello trying to protect his father as they got hit with the arrows and Splinter crying out for his son. Very well done. This one really made you feel stuff and I think it's going to have a lot of people talking which I'm already starting to see. Man, let's see how they finish this with the finale. One more issue left. As soon as we start getting info on it, you know I'll be talking about it here. So make sure to subscribe if you're new. Thank you all as always for watching. I will see you guys in a little bit with another video. Take care everyone. Armed.